I'm excited and honored to be joined today by Dr. Edward Mashery. He's a distinguished professor at the University of Pittsburgh and director of the Center for Philosophy of Science. He's published over 150 articles and book chapters on a diverse range of topics, including the philosophy of cognitive science, moral psychology, the utility of evolutionary theory and neuroscience for understanding cognition, folk psychology, and experimental philosophy. Edward, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to have uh, an opportunity to talk to you and to your listeners. And uh, thanks again for the invitation. Likewise. We were so excited, in fact, that off camera, we, we sort of started already. So I want to pick up where we left off. We were talking a little bit about free will and different conceptions of responsibility across cultures. Yeah, so uh, in some work I've done with some colleagues now some time ago, we looked at whether judgments of free will, control, whether you control your own action, uh, responsibility, whether you're responsible for what you've done, and blameworthiness, whether you're blameworthy for, for your action, might vary across cultures. And we used some, we used some well-known thought experiments from, from philosophy. Uh, we used two cases. Uh, one case um, is it's very metaphysical, so just bear with me for a second. So you just give people the following scenarios. Just imagine that the world uh, 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 can be recreated again and again, and it's all necessary. It obeys laws of nature. Right? So you do something, and there's a cause for your actions, there's a cause for your beliefs, and your cause for your desires. And that cause itself is caused by something before it, and so on and so forth, before your birth. And in fact, until the beginning of the world. So everything you do now is going to be determined by antecedent causes, right? It's just a setting of determinism, right? We want to make determinism intuitive for non-philosophers. And, and then we ask, and then we give people a scenario where um, uh, we describe an action, a negative action. And then we ask people whether the agent is responsible, blameworthy, was in control of her action and was free to do what she's done. And here, what we find is that highlighting determinism and causation really tends to undermine judgments about free will. And that's pretty much universal, right? So people all over the world, when you tell them, look, your actions are caused maybe by your beliefs and desires, but your beliefs and desires are caused by other things. Everywhere in the world, people say, hmm, I'm probably, the person is probably not responsible for, for what she did, right? So determinism seems to stand in, in contrast to intention with free will. But now what we also find is that we had another case where, uh, which is known as a Frankfurt case. And in the Frankfurt case, um, um, the agent does what she does because of her own free will. Oh, sorry, because of her own uh, will, desires, decisions. But if she had wanted to do something else, she would have nonetheless done what she ended up doing. So that seems to be a, it's a complicated scenario, which involves a counterfactual situation. Let me maybe put some flesh on that scenario. Um, just, and you know, it's a very famous science fiction type of situation. So just imagine that um, um, we are in 2008, and I think it was Obama versus Romney in 2008, or Obama versus McCain, I think. Oh, let's say uh, McCain or Romney. Oh, I think, I think you're right, McCain came first. Okay, so Obama versus McCain. And so we have a neurosurgeon and this neurosurgeon is really want Obama to win. So he put a chip in the brain of one of his patients. And the chip is going to work this the following way. If the patient goes to vote and decides to vote for Obama, the chip does nothing. If the, if the patient goes to vote and the patient decides to vote for McCain, then the chip kicks in and the patients end, end up voting for Obama, right? You got the situation? Uh, yeah. Now, the, the day of the election in November, the patient goes to vote and on her own decides to vote for, for Obama. So the chief does nothing, right? So her behavior is the expression of her desires and of her belief. Right? But of course, if she had had other beliefs, if she had decided to vote for McCain, so she would have kicked in and she would have ended up voting for Obama, right? So there's a counterfactual situation here. Now, if you ask that question to many people, many philosophers are going to say, yeah, the agent was free when she chose to vote for Obama. It expresses who she is, her beliefs, her desires. She did it on her own. She was in control of her action. 
and uh, she uh, and she's responsible and possibly blameworthy if she did something bad, right? And in it as a way, Americans and in fact most people in the world respond this way, but not people in Asia. So in Asia, when you look at at when you give this kind of of of, of cases. And by Asia here, I mean East Asia mostly. So uh, that will include Japan, various places in China. We had data from uh, uh, many places in China, data from Korea as well, data from Mongolia, so uh, Central Central Asia. But mostly, mostly most of the data from, were from uh, East Asia. What you see is that people in that case treat this situation very similarly to the first situation. They deny that the agent was free. They deny that the agent was in control. They deny that the agent was responsible for what she did. And they deny that she was blameworthy or praiseworthy for what she did. And the idea here is that people in Asia are much more sensitive to features of the context. People in the West really focus on the agent and separate the agent from the context when they make a judgment about free will and responsibility. Was the action expressive of her beliefs? and opinions and desires and decisions? Yes, it was. So she's responsible and blameworthy. In Asia, it's just not enough. It's you, know, you need to pay attention to the broader context, to what the neurosurgeon did in order to make a decision about uh, free will and responsibility. That's that we find. It's a very robust and surprising pattern where e Asia is a complete outlier here, not compared to the, to the West, but compared to the rest of the world. In that case, it's Asia versus the rest, versus the rest of the world. And um, I think the surprising fact is that um, that's exactly what we had predicted. We had predicted that um, as, uh, people from Asia would be much more sensitive to the context when it comes to this to, to um, um, assigning responsibility, assigning blame, making judgments about free will and control of action. Because there's this quite older literature that comes from the 1990s and 2000s that argues um, you know, and I think pretty convincingly, at least by by my by my light, I think it's not uncontroversial, but I think it's quite 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 impressive body of work that uh, people in East Asia are very sensitive to relational features, relation between characters and their environment, to the role of the environment in making sense of actions. Uh, that's the work of by people like Dick Nisbet, for example, at formerly at Michigan, and I think that led us to our prediction, and the results to our, our surprise beautifully. Uh, support this, uh, this surprising prediction that blame and responsibility vary across vary across cultures. Uh -huh. But in East Asia, you're not necessarily more sensitive to determinism in general? No, no, that, that's right. So that, there was no variation. I think it was a pretty striking feature that when it comes to determinism, everywhere, as well as you highlight causation as a feature of action, that your actions are caused by something you did not have control on, Namely, things that happened before your birth, people think, no, you're just not, you're just not really, really free from when you, when you, when you acted. Um, and I think that's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think in my mind, it suggests there might be a tension in your mind between two cognitive systems, uh, one that involves thinking in causal terms. And you think causal terms about often about the world, right? To make sense of the world, to decide about what you're going to be intervening upon. And thinking in terms of action, agency, responsibility, blame, and that when mm -hmm. we highlight one, it's much harder to think uh, in terms of the other. When you, we highlight agency, responsibility, blame, we are, we tend to uh, de-emphasize uh, agency. Of course, from a philosophical point of view, you might want to have both, and great philosophers have thought no, the two are totally compatible, but intuitively. Uh, the thought is that there might be a tension between these two intuitive systems uh, uh, when it comes to thinking about actions, right? You think mm -hmm. someone's action is caused maybe by... The, another example, which we talk a lot in uh, newspapers, for example, are genes take an action. Right. Say it was caused by her genes, right? Uh, and so you bring causation here to the picture to explain behavior. And I think the outcome is that then we are much less inclined, it's much less intuitive to think of the action as being morally accessible, as being blameworthy, as agent being responsible. So two really are, stands in tension with one another. So that's, I think, uh, what, what the first vignette says about, about uh, the, uh, uh, responsibility and uh, blameworthiness. I have a theory here that what your conceptions of free will are tied up in how you conceive of identity 
of the agent. So I'm, I'm going to tie together a bunch yeah. of seemingly distal er areas of philosophy. So the first has to do with the old Greek problem, the ship of Theseus, where right. you have a ship and you replace one wooden plank with another one. And you mm -hmm. ask, is it the same ship? And you're probably going to say, well, yes, it is. It just has this one new piece. But you repeat that process over and over again. And you have until you have none of the original material remaining. And the question, again, is it the same ship? You may say yes, because it maintains the same structure. You might say no, because none of the original material remains. But I think the fact that generally people will say yes if you replace only a single piece means that it's not uh, either or. It's sort of this iterative updating process. So like if you show it, if you show someone a new ship with all new materials right away, they'll probably say it's different. But if you update piece by piece, it seems like what you're really doing is redefining the identity of the ship every step of the way. Right. So I have that idea of you can constantly dynamically change your identity of something. Mm -hmm. This doesn't have to be a ship. This can be anything. And it seems like we're doing that with people as well, because your skin cells are dying and being reborn, for example, all of your cells. And yet we maintain our identity across time. Right. So there's this idea of being able to redefine your identity. And now here's another example. Uh, this is a simple free will type question. Let's say you're walking down the street, you trip over your shoelace. And you might say one interpretation is the shoelace is something that is not part of me. I am my bi biological organism and the shoe is some outside force. And right. I intended to step and continue walking along. I did not intend to trip. So the shoe interfered with my free will. But you could also say the shoe is part of me. In this moment, I'm controlling the shoe and it was my error to step on the shoelace. And I think that both of those responses are equally valid. I think it, what it depends on is whether you're considering the shoe a part of you or not. And I think mm -hmm. you can do that. It, you might say if it sounds silly to consider a shoe as part of you in the way you're conceiving of your identity, it would seem less silly if it was a prosthetic limb. So it does seem to be the case that we can include these non-human objects as part of ourself in the right context. So all of that, putting all of that together, I'm wondering if when you when people have different views on free will before and after considering something like genetic determinism if what's really happening is they have one identity of human that probably isn't taking into account genes and then when you bring up genes what they're really doing is updating the internal model in their head of like oh a human isn't just the person i'm looking at in their outside behavior it's also and then you add something new but then you're no longer dealing with the same question because you've secretly replaced the agent in question with a more complex agent without realizing it. You know, I, I think this is uh, like extremely plausible that questions about uh, free will, control of action, blamelessness and responsibility depends on the full conception of the self and both, both its dynamics, but also its boundaries at any synchronic uh, asynchronic time. I think this is extremely plausible. It's not unrelated to what we talked about a little bit earlier, because there's some suggestions that the boundaries of the self in East Asia and in the West are actually not, 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 not the same. It's classic mm -hmm. work in the night by um, uh, um, Katayama, I believe, um, I might be mistaken here, um, that suggests that the self has, has actually a much broader scope in the East than in, in the West. Um, and the two might be connected. I think it's a very, uh, very uh, interesting um, suggestion. I think it would be, uh, it could have interesting implications because there's been some research about uh, what affects people's sense of identity across, across time. So Sean uh, Nichols, for example, has done some work on the matter where uh, he's been arguing, I think it's debatable, but it's really suggestive that moral factors are really important for deciding whether you remain the same across time. So let's say your beliefs about the world, the physical world change. Are you still the same? Yes, I'm the same. You know, I've just changed my belief about, I don't know, the physical world. You know, I've learned some facts about the world. But what if your deep values, moral values change? Are you still the same person? And maybe there's a sense uh, in which actually when it is your moral values that change, 
you're not the same person. And if that's true, then we could actually, and if you are right, we could actually tie even more these bits about what causes permanence of people across time and uh, with uh, judgments about, about uh, responsibility and, and blameworthiness. Um, um, you know, as, as somehow people change their judgments about uh, responsibility and blameworthiness, you know, if you manipulate, for example, their deep values, you say, oh, John used to believe this and that, he was a very deep conservative person. Then he has a completely change of mind. He becomes a republic, he becomes a very liberal individual. Right. Mm -hmm. He's the same person, people say no. And then we might ask whether there's been a change in responsibility um, uh, and blameworthiness for some of his action. I do I do think it's very intuitive, right? I mean, um yeah, we have an intuitive sense of yeah. some some beliefs you might say were life changing. Others you would say, "Oh, I change my mind all the time, and it, it doesn't redefine it, me as a person." Exactly, but but also, when you've changed, are you responsible to what when you change very deeply? Are you responsible to what your past self was doing? Right. So you so just imagine that you you have a complete epiphany. Right, and you just change fundamentally your your world outlook. Everything you did before, you just can't identify anymore with it. Um, can you be held responsible for what you did before? And I think there's a sense in which it's not obvious that you can be blamed for what your past self did, because in some sense your past self just isn't you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, maybe your past self did horrible things. But, you know, your past self isn't you. You've changed totally, entirely. And so you get, in a sense, maybe some kind of free pass. And I think that ties quite well this, uh, this idea that you, you've suggested about the boundaries of, of the self, judgments about responsibility, and what causes um, uh, the self to change, to change across time, and maybe the role of some specific, the role of values, for example, in, in, in changing the boundaries of the self. Um, you know, intuitively, when I think about adult decision-making, I do think that you're responsible for all of your past actions. Oh, interesting. I, I, it's not a hard belief. I because I, yeah. I could see that maybe if we talked about that enough, I could be convinced otherwise. But in general, I I seem to believe that once you reach a certain critical threshold of right. decision making ca capability, then you're fully responsible. But as you know, I study adolescent development, brain development, right. and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm some of our research and others reliably shows that especially when it comes to executive functioning so things like cognitive control rational decision making planning for the future delay of gratification all of these things neurologically you're not able to do at full capacity until late 20s so there's there's sort of this outside interference maybe this ties back into determinism but so I, when I think of an adult cognitively able to do all of the same things, I give them, I grant them full responsibility, but then it gets a lot muddier if you think of children of who don't even have the same basic cognitive mechanisms to, to operate by. And right. especially when you're looking at adolescence, this is another moral gray area for me, because I, I think intuitively when you're looking at very young children, there's this sense of they're not responsible for what they're doing but if you look at a teenager especially in extreme cases of criminality it's like a, a teenage murderer should they get a life sentence in prison or not you you might say no because they're a child what if they grow up to be someone different and better but on the other hand you could say like it's still the worst crime you can think of why should we treat mm -hmm. them any differently from an adult mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah no i i um, um i think um, some of the questions here. Well, I mean, there's two sets of questions. There's, in a sense, uh, intuitive questions, you know, there's descriptive questions about what we are inclined to say and why. And then there's a normative question about what we ought to say based mm -hmm. on our best uh, uh, philosophical conception. Uh, uh, just to say a word about the, about the, 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 the letter, I, I think it's actually quite difficult to identify uh, the conditions that excuse from the exculpatory conditions, right? Conditions that just avoid, avoid, uh, exculpate people from blame and 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 responsibility. Now we do have very prototypical examples of of condition when you're 
drunk, for example, or, um, um, or you know, maybe when you have a moment of, of madness, you know, the law defines these kind of circumstances which are exculpatory, uh, and when you, when you don't have a knowledge of the right and the wrong, um, uh, and when you're not responsible for this moment of madness, which is why well, being drunk is not a good example, uh, then it's 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 quite clear that in these conditions, um, bl blameworthiness and responsibility can't be applied to an agent. Then we have cases, prototypical cases, where of course they can be applied, and an adult <laughs> is in full control of of of, of his beliefs and 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 desires. But then so all this gray area, and and I do think it's very hard to know how to define exculpatory conditions there that apply to these intermediary uh, cases. And I think that's why people are constantly uh, puzzled. I'm not, from a philosophical point of view, I'm not even sure there's a solution that's not purely ad hoc uh, mm -hmm. there that has got us it's fully satisfying about where to draw the line. And largely because I think it, it very much looks like one of these old, pa old uh, paradox where you have clear cases on the one hand, clear cases on the other hand, and you have gray cases in the middle. And there's really no place where you can draw a very clear line about, oh, this is a yes or this is a no, right? I mean, you know, what I have in mind is the writers, like being bold, having hair, you know, uh, uh, in the, in the yeah. middle, there's a gray area. And there's just no place where you're going to be a draw line that's not arbitrary. And I think in many of these situations where responsibility and um, blame, including you know, uh, behavior by teenagers, they do satisfy some of the uh, um, characteristics of full responsibility, but they do lack others. And that's why I think this is just such a difficult case. And I'm not sure there's a principal answer about what to do with them. I'm afraid uh, it's bound to be sort of a convention. What we as a society, what do we deem as a society the best answer to this kind of question? Mm -hmm. The drunk example is an interesting one because on one hand, you're not in full rational decision-making capacity, right. but it sounds like the implication was if you choose to drink, then you That's still right. have responsibility for that. So here's a thought experiment. It's related to this chip counterfactual idea. Mm -hmm. Let's say uh, you get drunk and your memory is wiped. So you don't remember deci deciding to get drunk and then you make a bad decision, like you get into a fight or something. Are you still responsible for it? And maybe the answer is still yes, because you chose to get drunk, even if you don't remember it. But then consider uh, another example in a, in a parallel universe where you were like secretly injected with something that put you into the same state of mind, but outside of your control. And also you have the memory wiped and you do the same dumb thing, uh, the same immoral action. Is that the case then that even though on the surface, those two worlds look identical, except for the before you lost your memory. In one case, mm -hmm. you chose to get drunk. And in the other case, you didn't. Do you think that would still change the the morality of your actions? Yeah, I mean, I tend to think indeed, I mean, the cases really aren't quite identical to one another. I mean, I what's really remarkable about the drunken case is that it's a very clear case of negligence. You mm -hmm. should have known better. And I think the reason why we hold people responsible in these cases is that we are taking them to be negligent. And um, uh, they should have known better. Uh, they should have known that getting drunk might lead them to do this behavior. So we hold them responsible, not because they intended to do it, not because they were in control of the action when they, do it, when they did it, but because they put themselves in a situation where they... Uh, we're not in control of their action by negligence. The other cases, the other case you described, it's harder to make a case of negligence stick, right? Because uh, the original uh, um, process was not one by which the agent was negligent for 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 doing what she did, right? She she just uh, did it uh, in some sense by accident. Um, uh, she was not negligent for getting drunk, um, so. Uh, right. And I think, and, and I do think negligence is a very important topic in uh, most moral philosophy, and I think it's getting an increasing amount of attention in moral psychology uh, as well as a lot of people who are actually right now trying to get a better understanding of the psychology of of negligence. Um, right. uh, yeah.
the the idea of negligence, especially in our legal system, it seems to require some referent, some idealized rational actor to to compare against. But yeah. it's if you if you ignore drugs and things like that completely, you, you're also going to have tremendous individual variability in cognitive capacity. I agree. So even if you I ignore agree. development as well, someone at the same age, we have terms like intellectually disabled. There's some critical threshold. I mean, really, it's just a continuum, but there's some sort of arbitrary point at which point we say we should treat this person differently because maybe they're not all there. I think this is a, a very insightful point. I think the notion of negligence is actually in part a normative notion. Um, you know, you uh, in, in the following sense, it does appeal to, as, I think, as you just uh, 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 said, it does appeal to a normative conception of what one ought to do. And as a you know, and and so, so one one what one one ought to do is in fact there's a, so what rational agent or someone who is reasonable and I'm, I'm not sure rational is the right word but reasonable here would have done uh, in this in these circumstances and um, one worry is indeed that this is uh, forgetting about indeed individual variation of all possible kind age. Um, uh, uh, cognitive development, maturity. Is that fair, for example, to say that uh, a 16, what's negligent for a 16 year old is what's negligent for a 44 year old? Um, you know, it's possible that the standards of negligence themselves should vary with respect to, uh, to, to, to age. And how to do that? In, is actually itself uh, uh, a very difficult, a mm -hmm. very difficult question, right? I mean, you know, uh, and in, in, and I, to be honest, I actually do not know how the law deal with that question. Um, negligence, of course, is based on the standard, but is the standard changed depending on who the person is? Um, it must be to some extent, but how widely it can be modified to make judgments about negligence, I, I. I don't know. And so it's, um, so it's, it's moving a, from yeah. a theoretical domain to a practical yeah. one. And in, in right. the theoretical domain, things are often continuous and practically you, yeah. you generally assign cutoffs. I know you've done work uh, also on philosophy of science more broadly, like on the methods. So in science, a lot of things are statistical, like you do an experiment and there's always some slight chance that the results you got are completely random due to random variation or noise in your data or just sampling bias or any of these things. And you do statistical tests on it to try and determine how unlikely that is. And oftentimes the most common threshold is 5%. So if it seems right. like there's less than a 5% chance that these data were produced purely by chance, we'll say that that is statistically significant and we can be at least 95% confident that this is a true finding. But again, there that's taking something in the real world that's continuous and then just putting this arbitrary cutoff and then using it to bias our decision making in one way or the other. Yeah, no, I, I mean, as as you know as well as as I do, um, the question of cutoffs in uh, statistics is extremely controversial and um, mm -hmm. and and debated. Um, classical statisticians coming from the early to, to early twentieth century, you know, Fisher and uh, and uh, uh, others um, were. We develop a, a way of drawing statistical inference that involves this conventional, um, this conventional cutoffs. And you're right, five percent is the usual one. That somehow psychology, the behavioral sensors, and some of the sensors, but not all sensors, have converged upon. If you do particle physics, the cutoff is five sigma, not five percent. So it's a much, right. much, 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 much lower cutoff. Yeah, like if you're um, designing a plane, you don't want there to be a five percent chance of that, failure. You want like point zero 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 one. <laughs> that 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 that's exactly right. In many ways, the cutoff here reflects our intuitive sense. We could probably formalize it, but our intuitive sense of the cost of making a mistake, right? Um, but as you know, it's it's uh, very controversial in in statistics. You know, people who are inspired by Bayesian statistics hate this this cutoff. They think it's actually. Uh, um, an indefensible, indefensible way of 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 making um, statistical judgment, statistical inference. I myself, um, um, while I can see the point of the Bayesian statisticians, I do think it's important to be able to make uh, decisions. And the role of the cutoff is, in some ways, to tell me 
I have enough evidence to make some kind of assertion that there is some kind of phenomenon uh, there. Um, um, and I, I'm afraid sometimes when I read uh, critics of uh, the role of cutoffs, uh, particularly Bayesian statisticians, that are really focusing on estimating values, right? And, and the diverse distribution of the possible values of a given parameter, that they don't really give us tool to make this type of decisions. And I think every scientist needs, the scientists need to be in a position to say, well, I've done the work and the work is at least suggestive that there's something there. Or at least seems to be um, telling me there's a real phenomenon there that should be confirmed, or there's none. Right. And mm -hmm. I think that's the point of cutoff. So while they're clearly, um, I'm not sure arbitrary is the right word, but convention, definitely conventional, um, I, I'm, I'm afraid we can't really do without them when it comes to doing science, right? So, because we need to be able to make decisions about what to report, mm -hmm. what, what, in which direction to, to keep doing science, in which direction to stop doing science, right? You know, at some point we need to say, well, yeah, I, I just, I'm, you know, it's not there. And sometimes we need to be able to say, it seems to be there and we want to keep going in one direction. And I think cutoff plays this very, very important role. Um, I, I'm pretty sure Bayesian would agree with that. They would just would want to understand cutoff in a very different manner than traditional, uh, traditional statistician. Um, yeah, there's, there's a uh, lot of work on this in neuroscience yeah. as well people who study decision making, because it seems like fundamentally we're operating on some statistical learning paradigm. And right. often mm -hmm. people do assume that the, the brain is doing something Bayesian. So right. like you take in mm -hmm. a bit of information and you update your beliefs and you do that continuously. But there's also evidence that you need some actual motivational uh, tipping point to actually do That's anything right. with that information. So that looks something like a cutoff. Oh, is it Absolutely, no. I think that is a very, uh, a very useful uh, analogy, and I think the tipping point is exactly, in some ways, um, one way to think about the significance level. You know, this five percent magical five percent uh, is as a tipping point. Um, now, I happen to think I've published a paper among many other people uh, a few years ago, arguing that five percent is too, too lax the quantity. We should actually probably have something at least an order of magnitude lower, probably 0 0.005. Mm -hmm. um, um, but independently of where you decide to put the threshold, uh, uh, I think having a tipping point is a very useful metaphor, is something you can't avoid uh, in, in, in science because you need to be able to make decisions about where to push your science, where not to push your science, what to report as being a result, what not to report as being a result, or what to report as being a non-result and so on and so forth. And tipping points are just unavoidable. And I think it's really remarkable. Uh, you're right, the decision-making seems to involve them, uh, not simply in terms of changing one's degrees of beliefs about what the world looks like around us. Um, I think this is a really um, remarkable similarity here. You might be familiar with Antonio Damasio. He's a of course, famous yeah. neuroscientist mm -hmm. and also very philosophically minded. He's written a couple mm -hmm. books incorporating the philosophy of Descartes and Spinoza with modern neuroscience research. And he talks about some case studies in, in his early neuropsychology research. So this is going way back prior to neuroimaging fMRI even being invented. So earlier neuroscientists studied case studies of people with brain lesions in different areas. And by mapping out people with brain damage in different areas, you can map out the different functions of those different areas. And there's remarkable consistency between the brain lesion studies and the modern neuroimaging studies. And Damasio did a lot of research on emotion. And he talks about some case studies in people with brain damage to specific emotion areas of the brain, and they retain their rationality completely. So if you ask them about a decision-making problem, they can give you like all of the pros and cons perfectly rationally, but they'll just endlessly cycle through the pros and cons and not be able to make a decision. So it seems like in our brain, we have two separate systems. You have the sort of Bayesian statistical generating a model of the world. That's the cognitive system. But then again, this tipping point idea, a threshold to actually motivate you to decision. Damasio argued, I think quite convincingly, that it's it's actually an entirely separate emotional, more primitive brain region that pushes you into action. Mm -hmm. 
No, I, I, um, I, I've always thought that, no, we can of course conceive of this dual system in many different ways, but I've always thought the idea that we have a valuation system and a cognitive system is a very important insight about um, many types of minds across many different species, very widely in the phylogenetic tree. And it's remarkable that how well, I mean, I've, how well it fits with our common sense, right? So in common mm -hmm. sense, we have, and I believe it's a universal aspect, but I'd have to be uh, checked. We have one class of terms for uh, doxastic states. You know, in English, we use the word belief. Uh, in French, we might use the word juger, penser que, or think that in English. But we also have words like what we desire and what we value. So we have these two classes of words, uh, conative and doxastic. States. And I think that's really a deep aspect of our, our uh, uh, the way we mentalize, the way we read other people's minds. Uh, I, I suspect it's universal. That's what an empirical claim would have to be uh, to be checked. But I think you mean a, universal across humans or across species? No, across humans. I think uh, 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 this mind reading, the idea that we have two types of states, thinking about desire, thinking about beliefs or, or, or thoughts. And I think... Uh, uh, it's true because it turns out that minds in general have this cognitive system, you know, models of the world building system and this evaluative system uh, and maybe an emotional system. I think that's a place where our common sense seems to have captured something deeply true about the basic cognitive architecture of um, um, the minds of many species, right? I think there's, a, there's a, a very nice echo here between common sense, where we have concepts for, for beliefs, concepts for desires, and what the minds really are like, you know, mm -hmm. collective states and an evaluative states. Um, I think that's actually quite, quite, quite remarkable because often common sense is mistaken, right? You know, as common sense has very strong limits about its accuracy describing the world. Uh, you know, you don't do advanced physics by consulting common sense. It's usually deeply mistaken. Common mm -hmm. sense is very tough to fair about medicine, about the causes of disease and so on and so forth. It's actually very often mistaken. But in that aspect, it seems actually to be quite accurate, right? So the, you know, the, the idea that there's, yeah, there are cognitive states and there are doxastic states desires, values on the one hand, and um, thoughts or beliefs on the other. That seems to be true, actually. Common sense got that right. Um, I think that's quite remarkable. Um, somewhat unusual, I would think. Edward, have you done any reading or writing on Carl Friston's theory of active inference and the free energy principle? No, I have not. Uh, I've avoided it. <laughs> I tend to be a little bit Skeptical, and in part, I, you know, it, it just ties extremely well to uh, what we just were talking uh, yeah. about right now. Because for Freestone, at least, no, I suppose there's many ways to develop Freestone inside in a philosophical context. But the way some people like Andy Clark, for example, have developed Freestone's views, uh, putting some philosophical flesh around Freestone's ideas, has led them to deny that they are, on the one hand, thoughts and on the other hand desires or values uh for them it's really the same thing there's only one thing which is our predictions about the world and our desires is just another way of reducing the conflict between our prediction and and the world uh, how do we do we have two ways to reduce it when there's a conflict between our predictions about the world and the world when there's a prediction error well you can change your prediction and that's what they take having beliefs, or you can change the world. And mm -hmm. that's what they think in terms of desires. But if that's the basic structure of the mind, then it's not the case we have on the one hand thoughts and on the other hand values, right? It's really just one thing, uh, predictions. And we uh -huh. need to accommodate the prediction error in two different ways. Um, so, and Andy Clark is very clear about that. He's actually stunning. You know, it's in, in many ways one might think, wow, this is a stunning consequence of Friston's um, predictive view of the mind that the distinction between thoughts and desires is actually not accurate. But I think, on the contrary, 
that in fact thoughts and desires have very different types of mental state, very different types of cognitive structures. And I think it's a, it has a very long phylogenetic history, right? You're actually going to find throughout the phylogenetic trees, two different parts of the brain, some dedicated to creating models of the, of the world, some dedicated to having values. And I've always thought, but it's, you know, it's here you're having me speak a little bit, you know, uh, uh, not things I've written about, but, you know, in a sense, my deepest secrets. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've always thought, I've always thought that this was actually a real issue for the predictive coding approach to the mind, that they can't really um, uh, accommodate the distinction between thought and values. In fact, it's not that they don't, they can't accommodate it, that they reject the deep distinction between uh, having a model of the mind, of the world, and uh, having values about the world. Um, so that and, has been always my, my concern. In Friston's free energy principle, the idea is that you make predictions about the world and you have a desired state, and then there's the world as it actually is, and there's some imbalance. And free energy is a measure of quantifying the entropy or the amount of error or gap between those two worlds. What mm -hmm. I'm, I'm struggling to see in your distinction here, value to me sounds like your desired predictive, your desired right. end state. So where's so, the disconnect there? So, so, so there might be actually many versions of Freestone. Uh, so that's, you know, they might, and you know, I'm, I'm far from being an expert. I, I, the way I've, I've understood Freestone and in part through the work of, of Andy Clark and a few other philosophers of cognitive science, is that we have a set of, but it was a little bit before the focus on the free energy principle. So that's actually uh, five year older, maybe uh, 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 before Friston really put forward uh, his, his uh, discussion of the free energy principle. But the way the earlier Friston sounded like anyway to me is that we only have a set, a model of the world which are a mm -hmm. set of predictions about uh, uh, signals I'm going to be getting from the world. And these signals can be, and what I'm striving to do is reducing the discrepancy between my model of the world, my predictions about, uh, the discrepancy between my model of the world and the signals I'm getting from the world. That's my only goal, right? Reducing the discrepancy. And there are two ways to do that. One way to do that is updating my model of the world such that I'm making accurate predictions of the world. That's what, it's, that's what philosophers would call change your mind. You're changing your mind. You're updating your models of the world. Another way to do that is by acting, right? So when you change the world, you are changing the uh, signals you're getting. So you can keep your model of the world, but change the world so that now the world is in line with your model of the world. Mm -hmm. right? So there's two different ways in which one can reduce the discrepancy between one's expectations about the signal and the signal one is getting. Change our expectation, change the world. Um, um, on this type of, of view, is that an accurate description of, of at least what Friston Said at some point in this area. So there's only maybe one way of thinking about that. One way of thinking about that view is there's only one value, which is reducing the discrepancy between our predictions and the signal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only thing we care about. But I don't. I think that's actually not accurate. In fact, I do think people have. Many, 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 there's a part of the mind or part of the brain, as you want to put it, that's creating many, 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 many different values that leads us to decision, right? I think mm -hmm. the, the, the mistake I see um, um, in that is my reconstruction, and maybe my reconstruction is, is inaccurate, in which case I should withdraw that concern. But the, the issue I see with that approach is that there's one and only one value, which is reducing the tension, this possible discrepancy between my predictions and the signal. Well, I think in fact, cognitive architectures, they have a model of the world and then they've got tons of very different values that have nothing to do with our predictions. They have things to do about what we want. Um, uh, and um, they're not really about reducing the tension between our model of the world and the signal between what we have.
Uh, so, I think that's so perhaps, such a, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Perhaps that would be then two separate comparisons across three conditions. So as opposed to only actual world versus model of the world, you'd have actual world versus model of the world versus desired state of the world. Exactly. 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 That's right. That's it. That, right. that seems, that I, seems I, exactly. I think in what I've heard of uh, the people talking about the free energy principle that those, the first and second and the second and third are sometimes used interchangeably. So the right. idea that one type of error could be your actual perception compared to what the real world is. And another type of error could be your perception versus or your prediction of what's going to happen versus what actually does happen. And mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it does seem like what's missing there is the the normative aspect of like, not only are you making a neutral prediction, but it's even if you're just thinking about simple animals, it's some survivally relevant prediction where there is an actual end goal, an end goal, not only just being right, but being right in producing something desirable right. or you exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. I mean, that's, this is exactly my, my, my concern with, with, with the model that caring uh -huh. seems to be absent, caring for, for the world seems to be absent from, 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 uh -huh. from the models. And, and I do think organisms, because of, indeed there are organisms they've been selected for to care for things and care, avoid other things. So caring is central for any organisms and i feel that uh, it's really been given short shrift in as uh, a predictive coding approach to go to cognition um, and I've, I've i've talked to uh, uh, andy clark i think uh, at least a couple of times about these kind of things um, um and i've never gotten back a very satisfying at least by my light uh, answer about that which was a long time ago and uh, maybe i was per not very clear perhaps the unifying point between those two would be that your goal is still to minimize that entropy, but again, it's not just entropy between the actual world and the model of the world, but it's there's there's right. also between the model of the world and the actual world and the world that you desire. That's right. That's right. Uh, but if that's if that, I think this, but if that's the view, then you really back to a dual system, right? You have uh -huh. the world that you wish you were in. This is your values, and the world that you think you're in. This is your beliefs or your credences, right? And my view is that it's hard to have to to avoid having this duality, you know. Um, um, and and as I understand it, really, what um, um, the predictive coding tradition tries to do is to go beyond these dualities. There's only one model of the world that explains both action and perception. I think that's a mistake. I think we need these two models of the world: the world that, as I wish it were, be it, it would it were. And the world as, as I think it is, uh, and that I think is central for understanding human, not only human behavior, but be, uh, behavior of pretty much. I don't know about any creature. I think some creatures don't have this kind of models of the world, but any any creatures with a sufficient amount of behavioral flexibility will have this kind of dual dual uh, representations. Um, intuitively, that, that's, that's a sort. intuitively, I do see that duality. Although I wonder if neurologically those are actually separate systems. Are you familiar with any of Dan Schachter's work on memory? Yes. And yeah, yeah. So Dan has argued that memory and imagination are using basically the same systems in the brain. Because when you imagine something, what you're really doing is taking bits and pieces of past experiences and assembling them in some new way. And if you, you look at neuroimaging experiments that he's done, episodic memory, which is where right. you're actually picturing yourself and like living, reliving a memory, looks almost exactly the same as if you're to imagine yourself doing something. Right. No, I, I'm very familiar with that uh, that work uh, in large part because Felipe de Briga has also done, uh, starting uh -huh. at, uh, in, in Schachter's lab, has done actually a lot of work on the matter since, uh, since he was a postdoc with, uh, with Schachter. And Felipe is a very good friend of mine. So I'm actually quite, quite familiar with that work. I think it's very, very interesting I actually don't quite think it's an objection to the view because that's all in the domain of thought, right? It's not only in the domain mm -hmm. of, of values or the world I wish I were in. But, um, but we, we imagine when we're imagining about a desired state of the world, usually it's not just for fun, or even if you are just no, no, laying in your bed fantasizing, the I imaginations, do. the fantasies have to do with desires. No, I think this is totally true. So, um, so 
the fact that we have two systems does not mean that they don't uh, interact in some ways. They do interact mm -hmm. in, 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 in many different ways. Actions results from putting the two together. Right? What, what I think the world is, what I think the world should be, well, that leads, that leads organisms to, uh, to, to act in a specific way. And one, I think, imagination is also driven by, um, uh, in a sense, what values, what, what I want the world what I want the world to be. Um, um, so so I, 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 I do think it is definitively true that the two, the two are always interacting in, in some ways, both to lead to actions, but probably to lead also to various form of imagination, dreaming, mm -hmm. even judgments. There's no doubt that my moral views, my values influence the way I judge about the world. Um, uh, but I still think somehow there must be two different, two different things to be able to interact and 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 have impact on on cognition or thoughts or or to lead to actions. Um, however, I do take the challenge. Uh, I think it's intuitive. I think it's um, probably just I, I you know I I would be willing to bet there's a huge amount of evidence for this duality. But at the end of the day, uh, it has to be um, um, shown that it's compatible with our best neuroscience. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I do think much of the work on, uh, uh, you know, uh, reinforcement learning, model-free learning, all of that work coming from neuroscience and modeling is very consistent with these uh, dualities that I've been describing a few minutes ago, uh, because mm -hmm. all of them are about acquiring a representation of not how the world is, but what I would like the world to be. Uh, uh, so I, I do think it's mm -hmm. there's really quite a quite a lot of evidence in neuroscience for supporting this duality of representations in in the mind and brain. But it's an empirical question at the end. You know, I, it's hard to decide from the uh, very comfortable armchair what the world mm -hmm. is like. So. When you think about this from an evolutionary perspective, looking at very simple organisms, sometimes it seems like they're described in. It's almost like they're not even. There's no cognition whatsoever. It's just like I agree. chemical interactions and like reflex responses or not even reflex, but like basically biochemical determinism. And that's never been satisfying to me because it doesn't seem like they're doing something fundamentally different if you scale, scale it up. And indeed, there have been people who argue that human cognition is just a very complex form of that biochemical determinism mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. on the other extreme, you have uh, if if this may or may not apply to the free energy principle we were talking about earlier, but the idea that if they are doing fundamentally the same computational mechanisms that we are at a more basic level, and if we're willing to grant consciousness to ourselves, then you end up with something like panpsychism, where even the most simple organism and maybe even uh, non-organic matter is is doing something similar. Right. So um, um, I... I, I tend to be um, somewhat uh, less, well, I'm not attracted to panpsychism for sure. Uh, uh, and I tend to be uh, somewhat less uh, um, attracted to the view that we can't characterize various types of action throughout the phylogenetic, phylogenetic tree in different manners. You know, I think um, what's really remarkable, and I think what's really an interesting research program is the evolution of different, increasingly complex, in general, there might be exception, but increasingly complex overall systems of control of actions. Right? That uh, if you look at at very far in uh, on the evolutionary tree, you might find very simple control of actions, and you find in, in contemporary animals uh, very simple controls of action. A cue, a perceptual cue leads to a behavior that's as simple as it gets. And then you can see there's a, a, a increasingly complex systems of uh, control of action. Um, and I think it's really important to um, map the differences and similarities in these um, ways of controlling action and see why in some environments, some control of action might have been selected for. Uh, and I think you know uh, some of the reasons is Flexibility, right? So for in some environment, we want an increased flexibility. In other environments, we want less flexibility, right? So if you live in a niche where just a cue 
in a kind of in an environment in which just having a cue leads to a behavior that's adaptive, then why would you have more flexibility? Why would you have greater control on your action? What's optimally adaptive is actually a, an inflexible behavior. So cue to behavior, adaptive ad adaptive behavior. Um, but I think it's really important to um, uh, uh, try to identify this great diversity in control of actions and see how and why they might have evolved at some specific point during the phylogenetic tree. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I don't think we have a very good sense of, of that. So I'm, I'm slightly less, um, um, I'm more attracted by the idea that there are some, something that we could describe as breaks changes during the evolution where interesting or transitions during the evolution where interesting new controls of behavior were selected for. Um, and uh, I've, I've not written about that. Uh, some philosophers have written a bit about that. Dennett has a, had a very nice book you now a long time ago called Kinds of Minds, which is a very short book, but very insightful um, about different types of, of mind. Um, and others have written also on the topic. Kim Sterelny has written some interesting work, uh, papers on the topic. But that's the kind of the view that attracts me. So it's a slightly, it's a more discontinuous view. And, and that's the one I'm not being pushed toward, uh, uh, you know, projecting our capacities to different, very different types of organisms or vice versa, thinking that what explains the behavior of different types of organisms also explains uh, our behaviors or our cognition. Would you say that in this model, free will is something like a continuous variable that defines how flexible or complex the overall system is? Yeah, that's an interesting thought, actually, that we might, if, if you have a, if you want to have a truly naturalistic theory of, of free will, you might actually think in terms of control of behavior. Uh, and uh, you might, um, I, I mean, I'm not sure whether it would be continuous, or having rather some kind of grades. No, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we can really think in terms of a, a continuum of, of of degree, but definitely it would have grades uh, and and it, it you know more or more or less. And I do think it's actually thinking in terms of increased control that leads maybe to increased flexibility is one way to have a naturalistic theory of of free will that's very different from the one traditional philosophers coming from Descartes have been, have been developing, you know, much more metaphysical. Uh, he is actually one that's anchored into what it means to have a control on behavior and what it means to have a flexible behavior. And I think we could have uh, a phylogenetic theory of, of free will um, uh, that would be actually really an interesting view to, um, to, to develop. At some point, Pat Churchland was writing a bit about that about um, uh, five to seven years ago. She had a couple of papers on control of action. Uh, and I think, I, I, don't, I don't believe she's, she's, she's developed that into a great phylogenetic context, but I do think this is a, a, a very uh, uh, interesting suggestion. I do think it would necessarily be continuous if you believe that adults have more free will than children, but maybe you could argue that they don't. Oh, I think, I think you, 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 it doesn't have to be continuous. You know, you can have, uh, degrees, you know, thinks in terms of um, a race, right? You've got the first, the second, the third, the fifth, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the tenth, the seventh, and so on and mm -hmm. so forth in a marathon. But of course, it's not continuous, right? Between the first and the second place, you know, you, there's no point and a half, right? So uh -huh. you can have grades without having continuity, right? So that's what I just, what I just meant, right? You can, you can think that right. adults have more free will, without thinking that free will is a continuous quantity. But um, age is um, continuous and the brain development that would give rise a, to good, that. Good, 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 good. It's, 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 it's an interesting question exactly how, uh, right, brain development is in some way continuous. I, I'm going to take your point there. Uh, uh, and I'd have to think a little bit uh, about whether it fosters on us a conception of control that's continuous. It might or might not. Uh, you know, one might think, for example, that evolution is continuous in some sense, but also thinking there are discontinuities, there are transitions built that takes place during evolution. And, you know, as, and as you know, there's a lot of work built on the transitions during evolution, massive amount of research done by evolutionary biologists. Um, and that, I don't know whether we could also combine the two ideas, right? A continuous change that leads to 
discontinuity at some point. I, I, it's all speculative, of course, here, right? Uh, uh, but I, I, do, I do think um, continuous change and discontinuity are not necessarily incompatible as evolution suggests and uh, as possibly development also would, would, would suggest. Um, but I, I, I think this is really an interesting interesting set of, um, of thoughts there. Absolutely, I, I could think about that for several yeah. years. We've covered <laughs> a lot of territory, Edward. Uh, I wanna close asking you what you're currently most excited about. Oh, um, I'm, I'm finishing a book uh, um, which is about whether when, why, how you should trust science. And uh, and uh, it's going to be a book that hopefully will be uh, completed by the end of the year, so maybe published uh, next year. Uh, it's going to be a book that's a little bit skeptical, saying that it's very important actually, even for scientists, to bring more skepticism to, to science. So it's going to be sort of a defense of the role of doubt and, and skepticism in science um, uh, as a counterpoint to the great emphasis on trust in science that I think is, 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 is not to deny that science is extremely remarkable and often deserves trust, but it's really to uh, uh, remind uh, scientists of the uh, importance of doubt and also the lay people and decision, decision makers of the importance of doubt, skepticism, prudence, caution uh, with respect to science. So the book is about trying to understand how to have this proper balance between um, trust in science, but also doubt with respect to science because of the complexity, the incredible complexity of the scientific process. You know, science is one of the most incredibly complex human endeavor, human project, and you know, one of the most successful in many ways, but also one of the mm -hmm. most difficult. And I think when we just talk about the trust that we owe science, we're forgetting about the complexity and and the challenges that are just unavoidable for anyone and you know you're a scientist so you know all about how difficult science is and how uncertain it is so the book will be exactly about this trying to deal with this very difficult tension between trust and and doubt you know not not uh, do your own research uh via, via climate denier type of doubt but that as a very important aspect of a scientific mind. Anyway, so that's that's a book I'm very excited by by it because I think it's uh, it it's it's going to be counteracting what I take to be ultimately a very uh, harmful um, relation to science, where we are told to just trust science all the time, and when we are told to do that, and when science doesn't work, and it's bound not to work because it's so complicated at time, it's going to mm -hmm. fail. And it has failed again and again, it will fail. People are very disappointed because they've been told to trust science. They haven't been told that science is actually complicated, fallible in many ways. Um, uh, they haven't been given a realistic understanding of what science really is like. And when they realize that science fell, they get very disappointed and they get angry at, at science. And I think what we've mm -hmm. seen in, over the last few years is telling people to trust science leads to uh, backlash. Against, against science. So I think the book, by just really um, highlighting the significance of, of doubt, skepticism, um, uh, is going to, at the end of the day to do a, a great service to, uh, um, to, to science as a, one of the most admirable and complex human enterprise. Anyway, I'm very excited by that book because I think it's, it's, it's very much needed in, in our time to uh, help people have a better understanding of what science really, really is like, how important, but how difficult it is. That anyway, sounds that's really, incredibly yeah. important uh, and interesting. Yeah. I would love to do a follow-up episode yeah. on your book when it comes out. I'd, I'd love it, actually. Uh, hopefully next year. I'm, I'm finishing the last chapters, and I'm going to have eight months to a year of workshopping, polishing it with, with other people, and then send it to the editor. So looking forward. Thank you very much for your time, Edward. Thank you very much for having me. It's been really a, a very enjoyable uh, discussion. So uh, many thanks again.